Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, Executive Editor at the Mises Institute. And with me is my co-host, Tho Bishop. And also we have with us one of our economists here at the Mises Institute. One of our top guys, Jonathan Newman. And I brought Jonathan on to talk about uh, how business cycles work, how the Fed has a role in all of that. And, and we're really going to draw upon a lot of information that came out from our new documentary that came out. 10 days ago uh, called Playing With Fire. And so we'll go in some, into some details about uh, the Fed's involvement in the business cycle, how it's impoverishing us, how it's inflating the money supply, and how that's a problem for you. And we'll go into some details there. But uh, first, though, uh, we've, got, we've got an event coming up next month, right? Yeah, November 9th, uh, shortly after the election, we've got an event down in beautiful Fort Myers, Florida. Elections in the economy, do they really matter? We've got a great speaker lineup, including Mises Institute President Tom DeLorenzo, Mark Thornton, Wanjiro Najoya, and the great Murray Sabrin, one of our good friends. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a fun event down in Fort Myers. Unfortunately, I will be not making the trip down there. I have a little one coming shortly thereafter. So I will not be making the trip down there. But it uh, should be a great event with a lot of great people. So yeah, Fort Myers, November 9th. You can find more at Mises.org slash events. All right. Well, if you've been paying any attention at all to our various media feeds, you know that about 10, 10 days ago, our documentary, our, it's got good production values, serious documentary. It's Great at narrator. the beginner level. It's got tip-top narrator by uh, narration by yours truly, and I wrote uh, some of the, uh, uh, the text for the narration as well. Because, of course, we wanted to make sure it was, uh, it was reflecting the Austrian school. And what it, uh, what it centers on is commentary from a lot of our top experts. We got Alex Pollack, our senior fellow. We got Joe Salerno. We got Mark Thornton in there. We got Jim Grant in there, uh, who, boy, if you're not familiar with him, check out uh, Grant's Interest Rate Observer, top Wall Street observer. And, uh, but also one of our uh, key commenters is Jonathan Newman. And we've got Jonathan here. Uh, to really expand on some of the stuff he's talked about in the documentary. And by the way, you can watch that on any of our streaming video platforms, including YouTube. That's a YouTube Mises media channel. And Jonathan, I mean, part of the reason I had you on is um, as soon as the, the documentary came out, there we started getting people sort of in our circles nitpicking uh, the <laughs> becoming all pedantic about some of the details in uh, the documentary, one of whom was Miss Shedlock, who's this uh, newsletter investment guy, and I guess thought uh, saying that top economists at the Mises Institute don't know what they're talking about, they like literally said this, uh, would make him look smart or something, maybe get him more newsletter subscriptions or something. And uh, so you then had to respond. And so I just wanted, uh, to set this up a little bit, just to give you a chance to talk about this topic a little bit more, because I think it is fundamental to what our listeners are interested in, in terms of what is the role of banks in the business cycle, right? We, we talk about banks a lot. We've used uh, the, old, uh, the old phrase, separation of bank and state, which uh, comes from the Jacksonians uh, from the 1830s or so. It's a great phrase and certainly still relevant today. And when we communicate these issues, often it has to be in a very casual tone, right? Because a lot of the time this information is coming across in 900 word articles, right? People aren't reading books about banking that are 500 uh, pages long for the most part. I know some tiny percentage of people do do that, but most people aren't doing that. And so we have to, we have to talk about this stuff and frame it in pretty simplified terms a lot of the time. So we use phrases like printing money. And then people think that we, the, the people criticize it like, well, you know, they're not really printing money on printing <laughs> presses. You people are stupid. Like, like we don't understand that. And uh, this is, this is a, I think, a case of that where you people don't even understand how, uh, how banks work with the central bank to inflate the money supply or have historically. So I just wanted to come back to that and really look at this issue of what, what is the bank? Uh, what is the role of banks in the business cycle? And what is this relationship between commercial banks and the Fed? 
and what does this have to do with monetary inflation? So I think I'm just going to kick it over to you and, and kind of let you go with that, since you can explain it much better than I can. Sure. So you're absolutely right that we, we tried to simplify things to a certain extent, you know, use more casual language when we're writing our popular articles. And also in the in the documentary, the target audience was, the, you know, the intelligent layperson. Uh, and, the, and the idea is that they would see the things that are being said in the documentary and then do a deeper dive in some of the topics. But that doesn't mean that we were, you know, compromising or saying incorrect things. So, so yeah, we, we were... Uh, it was based on interviews, and the goal was for us to make the case that the Fed is a bad institution um, in these sit-down interviews. But um, Mish Shedlock, who you mentioned, he he had this uh, critique of our, a segment that appears at the very beginning of the documentary where we were trying to make the case that the Fed was instituted in response to the instability of the banking system at the time. And so we were describing what made banks unstable uh, back before the Fed. Why, why did we have business cycles? Why did we have bank runs and financial crises uh, before the Fed? So if, if people think that uh, in this video all we're doing is we're just trying to blame the Fed for all of the bad things, you know, they do get a lot of blame for, for many bad things, but if, if they think that Austrians just think all of the uh, business cycle problems started with the with the Federal Reserve. That's that's incorrect. We, that's never been the claim, um, and so that's why we were that's why we spent some time talking about what banks would do before the Fed, uh, which is that they would engage in fractional reserve banking. They would take in deposits. They would keep some of that money in reserve. They put the cash in the vault, uh, and then they would lend out uh, some some bank notes to somebody who comes in wanting a loan which means that there's a mismatch. There's a mismatch between uh, how much money has been deposited and uh, the amount of reserves, how much the bank can actually redeem. And so obviously that poses a problem for the bank that exposes them to uh, a possible run. So if people start uh, wondering, I, I hope I can get my money out, uh, I better be first in line in case, you know, uh, everybody starts trying to withdraw their money at the same time. And that way they increase the likelihood that they get their money back and other people are, are left empty handed. So that's, that's what led to the instability of the banking system before the Fed. And of course, there was still some government involvement. There was you know, some government protection of the banking system even before the Fed, uh, which helped allow that system to continue to operate as opposed to just let market forces, um, let, let the threat of a bank run uh, regulate the banking system. You, you get what I'm saying? So, like, we don't need government to necessarily regulate what banks are doing. We just need, we just need banks to compete with each other and for uh, profit and loss to help guide banks in, in terms of what what loans they're going to offer, how much they're going to keep in reserve. And of course, there's this whole other debate that I'm not even going to talk about about the the, the legal issue or the fraud issue. Uh, but the point is that. It, it takes government involvement to institutionalize this. It takes government regulation of the banking system to make fractional reserve banking uh, institutional so that it, it is practiced and it's widespread, and which means that the effects of it are, are more extensive and deeper and, and go on for a longer time. And so that's exactly what we got with the Fed. Okay, back to back to Mish. I know I'm sort of like going all over the place here, but so he he looked at this segment of the documentary where we were describing what made the creation of the Fed necessary in the first place in the minds of the people of the time, uh, and it was the instability of the banking system. And so he quoted me saying, "Fractional reserve banking is the idea that banks keep a fraction of deposits in reserve, so that somebody walks in and makes a deposit. What the banks actually do is." take that money and then use it to finance loans that they make to other people, business loans and mortgages. And then he also pulled a quote from our uh, Joseph Salerno saying, uh, talking about the same topic, about the same thing. And so Mish, uh, who is a, a believer in the endogenous money view, which is that banks don't take in deposits and then make loans. What actually happens is banks make loans and then those loans turn into deposits in the banking system, which is uh, – that's one way to describe what's happening in, like, modern banking practices. So he pulled, he pulled those quotes out of context because we were talking about what banks used to do. And, in fact, even in his article where he's critiquing us, he said, I used to think that banks never did this sort of thing, but now I think that they did operate in, in the way that uh, – 
uh, Salerno and Newman are describing. And so even he admitted that what we were describing in the in the documentary was the way banks used to operate. So then that leads to the. By the way, any qu maybe I should. Stop. <laughs> How am I doing? Any questions so far? <laughs> I feel like I'm just lecturing. <laughs> no, no, I think, you know, I'm just struck by like the, how pedantic the whole thing is in that it's clear, right? The, the point of the discussion is that there is not a clear connection. There is by no means a one-to-one -one relationship between <laughs> what banks are taking in and what they're loaning out. Right. Like loans are not uh, banks are not constrained by deposits or by actual assets in terms of what they can loan out. And this is all the more true in a situation where you, there's all this implicit bank backing from the central bank uh, for banks that do that are uh, at uh, the brink of say a bank run right and and bank runs have been at the center of all of these attempts for many many decades to smooth over the the business cycle and even before the fed right a lot of it they had these clearing houses and all these other issues these attempts to create this lender of last resort and that was how what the fed was sold on it was just going to be this lender of last resort it didn't wasn't going to have all these other powers these vast powers that it has now, uh, but there was going to be at, at some. It was thought there was going to be some selectivity to that, or the Fed would only would only bail out the depositors. Uh, but we are so way beyond that now, mm -hmm. right? Where I mean, it's not it's not like the bank just has to not worry about its depositors being made whole. The bank can count on probably a bailout of everything for the bank itself, so the bank will survive. Uh, and many of its investors, in many cases, and and of course the Fed can pick and choose who it's gonna who it's gonna bail out, who it's gonna save, and that that then in order that that's a matter of political influence. You want to make sure that you have enough influence in Washington that that your bank uh, gets saved. Like we all know that Chase is going to be okay, even in case of of major financial crisis. And so this this court of squabbling over, okay, well. What is the exact relationship then uh, in this year versus that year in terms of uh, where where are the the loans coming from? What you need to remember is that uh, there's a lot of people are just kind of taught that there's some sort of honesty or some sort of transparency uh, or some sort of responsibility to the depositors going on in these banks, and there isn't. That the <laughs> the banks are not worried about their depositors. They're worried about the political process and ensuring that they're going to get their access to that money in case things go horribly wrong. And it's that those huge amounts of risk that banks engage in that drive a lot of the business cycle. And as I see it, that's that's the main takeaway here. But but you have to then get into a variety of these theories. Uh, that uh, that this newsletter guy talks about, and he's certainly not the only one. I saw a lot of this other stuff, you know, kind of this actually stuff where people are, well, actually, this is the way the banking system works. And uh, we're trying to address the issue of really trying to communicate to people that um, <laughs> that banks are not what they seem to be. And it's astounding how much of the public doesn't even understand how this is going on. And, and that's really at the heart of the matter. Until people can really, I think, understand how these banks actually work and where the real risk is and what banks are really worried about and what they can expect in terms of intervention from the federal government, most of that is totally opaque and unknown to the general public right now. And uh, that, that is the message that needs to be communicated, I think, pretty broadly. Yeah, you're right. This is a, a, a squabble over a, a minor thing. So I, I think that the the people who are on the endogenous money side, they make some good points. I, I do think it some of their claims are true in terms of the way modern banks uh, uh, make loans. However, other claims are incorrect. Uh, if uh, if you're a listener and you're interested in this debate and, and like what Austrian scholars think about it or, or how at least one Austrian scholar has thought about it, I recommend that you check out Robert Murphy's book, Understanding Money Mechanics. And he's got a whole chapter on this debate. And he, he takes apart this, uh, this report by the Bank of England that really kick-started, really catalyzed this debate over endogenous money. Um, and he just – he goes, you know, point by point and he says, yeah, they're sort of right on this – 
point, they're incorrect on this point, or the two sides are talking about different things, or there's semantic problems. Uh, one of the main issues is that uh, sometimes the, the perspective of the entire banking system is conflated with the perspective of an individual bank. So, so the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that <clears throat> there, there is some truth to, to what these people are saying about how modern banks operate. However, Austrian economists have addressed it. We've, we've, we've looked at it, we've, we've uh, considered the implications of it, and the conclusion that I've drawn and that other Austrian economists have drawn is that it doesn't matter. So wh whether, whether you have a deposit first and then a loan, or a loan first and then a deposit, doesn't matter for starting business cycles. So it, you, either way, you still get an expansion of the money supply, you get an artificial lowering of the interest rate, you get a misallocation of resources, malinvestment, overconsumption. It doesn't matter what the order is. It doesn't matter which comes first. Um, so it, yeah, the, the old textbook uh, descriptions of the money, multi money multiplier process might be outdated, especially given modern changes in the way monetary policy is conducted. Uh, so, like, there, there is no, there aren't any uh, reserve requirements anymore, and the Fed is paying interest on reserves, and that totally changed the way the banking system operates. So, all of that is true, but what is still true is Austrian business cycle theory. Like that, that is immune to the order. That's immune to whether a loan comes first or a deposit comes first. One other thing that I'll, I'll mention on this topic is that. So some of the endogenous money people are, are on the Austrian side of things, and, and they agree, yeah, you can have these artificial booms, uh, but they would say the Fed can't be blamed. Since all of the money is coming from the banking system, all of the new artificial credit is coming from the banking system and private commercial banks, it's not coming from the Fed. So like a, a very pure view of endogenous money would say that the Fed is just passively responding to to what the market wants. The Fed just passively responds to the demand for reserves in the banking system. So uh, one, one thing that I, I pointed out in, uh, in a chapter for uh, Per Bylan's uh, book that he edited, a, a Modern Guide to Austrian Economics, I think is the title. Uh, Arkadiusz Sierin and I uh, wrote this uh, chapter on Austrian business cycle theory. And we were trying to you know bring it up to date. We're trying to address current issues and, and current debates over Austrian business cycle theory. And we actually talked about the endogenous money debate. And <clears throat> we came to the conclusion that even if the, the, a very pure version of the endogenous money view is true, you still have to blame the Fed because the Fed is what enables the banking system to engage in that uh, fractional reserve banking, even if it is loans first and then deposits. So like, just grant them that, grant them the order of operations, this loans first and then deposits are, are made in, in the uh, banking system. Uh, the, the only way that banks can get away with that is if they're protected, if they're cartelized, if they're uh, a part of this group under one central bank that acts as a lender of last resort, you've got to have FDIC, you've got to have all these banking regulations, uh, capital requirements. You have to have a Fed that's paying uh, interest on reserves to incentivize banks to hold on to reserves. So e even if there's not like, a, even if you can't blame the Fed directly, there's still a ton of indirect blame for creating an environment in which the banking system can do that. Yeah, the idea that there's a, <laughs> that that the banks would be behaving, anything resembling the way they behave without the central bank and all of its regulations and all of its implied protections. And even, even if we had something that wasn't like this obvious unified central bank, say we had something that was functioning out of the treasury that was, was be behaving as a lender of last resort or something. It wasn't a separate central bank at all. And of course, I've run a couple of articles in the last couple of weeks on this whole idea that the central bank is even this separate thing from the treasury is mm -hmm. pretty nonsensical. That was a great article, by the way. Oh, thank you. And uh, I mean, historically, of course, it's clear, right, is that the Treasury does what it's required to do politically. And that was true in 2020. It was true in 2008. It always does what the Treasury wants it to do. And there's this song and dance that they do. Well, oh, the Fed, well, you, you need to get your fiscal house together, federal government, because we can't always <laughs> bail you out. They always do. They always <laughs> bail you out. It's a total dog and pony show. 
And so it doesn't have to be a separate institution. So say it was like something that was like uh, separated across different departments in the federal government rather than this like unified central bank thing. They would do all the exact same stuff, right? One department would provide the regulation, another department part would uh, uh, would hold uh, some uh, some some money in a way that would allow them to pay interest on reserves, and they could accomplish all the same goals without a central bank. Would these same people then say, oh, you can't blame the federal government for business cycles, <laughs> for its endless meddling in the banking system? That's all we're saying is the federal government's endless meddling in the form of the Federal Reserve, which is part of the federal government, gang, uh, is, is a major contributor to the issue. Now, it's true in the late 19th century, you didn't have a central bank, and, and it was more centered around uh, the federal government and other protected monopolist institutions that had more f uh, informal uh, situation. There was less meddling. And by the way, this was a period of some of the greatest gains in the standard of living that the United States and the Western world mm -hmm. has ever known, that period that a central bank. They always bring up, oh, there were, there were all these increasingly bad bank runs. And yet somehow the standard of living was getting better and better throughout this period. So... Uh, they're trying to distract from the real issue there, which is that uh, the absence of a central bank uh, created a period of, of great actual gains for ordinary people. And so, so now there, with this idea that, oh, just blame the commercial banks and the, and the federal government and its central bank have nothing to do with it. It's just not very plausible. And we can see how closely connected it is to everything the Fed does and how even where the Fed fails to provide some sort of bailout, then you'll get something like TARP, and which will be, of course, engineer. The, I mean, the primary mechanism that carries out these federal programs is, in fact, the central bank in many cases by providing the necessary liquidity. And so the central bank is at the center of it. So it's, it just seems odd to me to try and and say that, oh, well, this whole mechanism is really, uh, it's, it's just the commercial banks and the Federal Reserve is this innocent bystander. I, d I don't know why they're trying to say that, except maybe they've just been successfully propagandized by the central bank. Uh, but it's just not a very realistic view of how the economy works. When it comes to mind, one, one of uh, Slarno's articles, uh, a modest proposal to end Fed independence to try to break away some of that opaqueness with the way the process works. Um, you know, we propose this kind of, you know, taking away kind of the, this, the veneer of kind of this independent central bank and kind of make it, a, you know, into an, the explicit political uh, institution that it is in practice. Um, but but I, I do think this larger conversation is very interesting because, again, you know, it's, it's the aspect of, again, the, the, the theory is the same, the, the role of credit expansion, the role of, again, government manipulation within these markets, uh, you know, the, the consequences of financialization more broadly in our economy, and, you know, the actual inner workings, kind of the plumbing of the way the system works in practice. And I think that's one of the aspects where, you know, there is a lot, you know, you know if you're, you're simply reading, you kind of say, you know, Rothbard's mystery of banking right now in 2024, you're going to get an outdated view of the way the banking system, because it's been so many radical changes. Um, but we do have a tremendous amount of, of research coming out from Austrian scholars guided by the theory into modern practice. Bob's book is, is fantastic on this. Uh, Arcadia Serion, along with the article that Jonathan mentioned, has a really fascinating um, QJAE article uh, dealing with shadow banking, kind of that as, as more you know, modern institution, the way that that plays in, in banking cycles, things like that. And it seems to me often what you get when you have people like like Matt Ch Mike Shadlock, who who I'm, I'm, I've read Mike for for over over a decade now, I've always been you know very, very interesting perspective, you know has has a lot of interesting things to say, and and, and he himself is is a critic of the Fed. He wants to end the Fed, um, so he's not like a, a Fed lackey per se. Um, they just kind of have some some critiques from their perspective on some of the kind of again, some of these more contemporary issues. But again, the goal of you know what we're trying to do, particularly with a movie like this, is to try to get people to think to understand both the theory of why state manipulation of money and credit has the consequences and the way they played out in 08, 09, how they played, played out after COVID, you know, the realities of what we're still dealing with right now. And, you know, again, that's not going to, you know, there, there's going to be aspects of that in terms of the way the complicated, you know, contemporary system is that, again, average people don't need to know the nuts and bolts there as long as they understand that, you know, it is the, the state manipulation of money and credit that is playing so many of the, the consequential roles that are making us all poor and growing the state at our, uh, you know, at, at, for, at our expense. Yeah, it's, it's a good point, though. Um, I, I'm glad you brought up uh, Mish's uh, view more broadly. 
I, I, he, he's he's one of us when it comes to wanting to end the Fed. He, he, so I don't want to I don't want this to turn into like we're just hating on Mish Shedlock uh, and every everything that he's ever said is wrong. I, I mean, he, I, I've read some of his other stuff and he, he's got he's got a good perspective. He's he distrusts central banking. He wants to audit the Fed. He wants to end the Fed. He wants to uh, decrease the power of the central bank. So so. <clears throat> but this this criticism is just what we're focusing on now. The another aspect of, of this criticism uh, that you sort of see implied in Shedlock, but you see it more explicitly in other critics, is that um, Austrian economists are too focused on the Fed and they ignore the banking system. So they ignore the fact that banking practices have changed uh, and that monetary policy has changed fundamentally. So they they view us as just like a broken record. Like we're always just we're always just saying the Fed starts the business cycle. The Fed starts the business cycle. Therefore, we should end the Fed. But that's not what we're saying, and that's not what, we, what we've ever said. Like if you go all the way back to uh, Ludwig von Mises's uh, 1912 theory of money and credit, he he blamed the banking system. He blamed the issuance of fiduciary media, fractional reserve banking for causing the unsustainable booms that are followed by an inevitable crash. So, and, and, but then of course later in, in, in uh, both in that book, but in the rest of his career, he said, uh, you know, these bad banking practices, not only do they cause business cycles, but they're exacerbated by central banking. They're, they're made worse and, and they become broader and deeper and, and worse uh, through the institution of central banking. So central, central banking is not a solution to bad banking practices. Um, it, uh, w one thing that's been clear from Austrian economists over, over uh, since Austrian economics has existed is that whenever the Fed is, whenever the, the government is getting involved in anything, it's going to make it worse. And the same thing applies to the institution of fractional reserve banking, and then when you add on top of that central banking, and then you can get even bigger swings in the money supply based on what the Fed is doing. More manipulation of interest rates is going to—it's not going to solve the problems. It's just going to make them—it's going to make them worse. And that has been constant throughout all of the history of Austrian economics. It's not like—it's not like we're uh, just sort of like stuck in the gold standard days and we can't think about anything uh, except. In terms of the gold standard, that's not true. Uh, there's there's plenty of modern research, as as though mentioned. There's plenty of, st of new stuff that's coming out where we're addressing the new issues, addressing the new debates, addressing the new monetary policy tools that are being implemented by the central bank, and and uh, what what we found is. Lo and behold, the government is still bad. The Federal Reserve is still bad. <laughs> Fractional Reserve banking is still bad. <laughs> Well, if we, and we get it from both sides. Uh, we get it from the gold bugs, too, because we're not pro-gold yeah, enough, yeah. because we'll write something about money and what money is and so on. And we all, and I always get then emails from, oh, only gold is money. Gold's the only real money. I'm like, well, gold isn't money right at all right now. It's not the generally accepted medium of exchange. Uh, but there's all of these slogans that are circulating among some of the gold people and so they don't like it when we refer to dollars as money, which dollars are clearly money. <laughs> and, and, so, and so then they get all over us uh, for not being pro-gold enough because we're just discussing the realities mm -hmm. of the modern economy and the modern banking system. And this, by the way, is something we emphasize in the video uh, in Playing With Fire, the Fed documentary, is that uh, things are considerably different after 2008 is uh, the, the we created vast new powers, we, by which mean the federal government, which I'm not a part of. Uh, <laughs> so you can see how brainwashed word, I've been we, there. isn't it? Right. <laughs> We've had it imposed <laughs> on us all these days. <laughs> right. We had imposed on us vast new Fed powers, which, as you said, one of those changes was now paying interest on reserves, which changed the way the banking system worked, but not in a way that was relevant to how business cycles begin. And that's something that, that needs to be emphasized as well, right? It's irrelevant, uh, just as w whether the Fed is owned by private stockholders or by the, by the federal government is irrelevant to how the central bank behaves. There are lots of little things you could point out that just simply aren't relevant to the business cycle. And I think that's, I think that's what some people are losing sight of in, in a lot of this debate. Yeah, yeah, so you're right. Uh in terms of the theory, it, it is irrelevant. But like when we're gonna one day look back on this um, this part of history, and we're gonna try to analyze what caused the 2020 crash, what caused the 2008 crash, 
then that's when you can go and look at the particulars of you know certain policy changes. What what tweaks did they make? What what uh, dramatic overhauls of the way that they do monetary policy? What changed? And that and that will help you tell the story of of how exactly that particular cycle got started. But that's doing economic history. Uh, that's which stands uh, sort of like in its own stands on its own separate from economic theory. Of course, we use economic theory to help us make sense of economic history. Uh, but the economic theory of Austrian business cycle theory is it's immune to all of these little changes in the way monetary policy is conducted. It's it's the, the theory stands uh, j just to go very quickly through it. The theory is that you get an unsustainable artificial boom if the interest rate is pushed below what would have happened on a market. And you can get that happening with fractional reserve banking. You can get that happening with a brand new central bank that's just learning how to do monetary policy. You can get that with a mature central bank that is you know, expanding reserves and that causes a big increase in the amount of credit. You get that uh, with a central bank that is increasing the amount of reserves um, and, and therefore, uh, it stays in the banking system because they've started paying interest on reserves, and therefore, the credit expansion is coming from other parts of the banking system. So the, the theory applies in all of those different regimes, so to speak. It, it, it applies in all of those, which means that our, our critique of the Fed and of bad, unsound banking practices is just immune to all of these criticisms. And it should be remembered also that ignored from much of this discussion, often because the discussion depends on economists talking among themselves, is ignoring the political realities uh, behind manipulation of the interest rate and the need to fund the central government. Uh, this, is, this is separate from what anybody cares about. Are the banks solvent? Uh, how are the banks doing? How are we regulating the banks? At the core of central banks is the need to ensure that the central government always can borrow cheaply and can access money, especially for its wars. Uh, and of course, the central banks that are in countries that have lots of war involvement are worse uh, for the most part than countries that tend to stay out of wars. But nevertheless, they're always the, the central concern of a central bank is to fund the central government, of which the central bank is a part. And th this, you cannot then have any sort of serious political analysis of central banks and their effect without taking that into account. And so if you're framing always the manipulation of the interest rate in terms of, well, they just want to, they want to help this bank or they want to raise employment or that sort of thing, especially when you're dealing with a government that has 35 trillion uh, in, uh, in debt, you simply cannot allow the interest rate to rise above a certain level because it could cause a sovereign debt crisis. And, and if everyone was, and they're always saying, oh, well, that's okay, all the world wants uh, government treasuries. If that were true, then the Fed would never have to buy them in order to keep the interest rate low. It's not true. The Fed has to mop up that excess supply that the world isn't demanding at a low enough interest rate. And so that's the reality of it, and that's why you get a lot of this Fed intervention. It's not even necessarily to, to prop up banks or any of those other issues. However, those policies affect banks substantially. So you could even argue that all Fed policy is actually, that the banks are just downhill from all Fed policy, and that really it's not even about being a lender of last resort. I mean, we could, we could look all over the place at what the, the, or, the, origin of, the origin story of monetary inflation is, if you will. But if we take the view that it's actually political, and that's why central banks came into existence, which is absolutely the case with the Bank of England, the world's first central bank. It was there to fund the English monarchy and parliament. Uh, and then all of this other stuff flows down to the commercial banking sector and creates the conditions for business cycles. I mean, you, you can't ignore that either. So there are a lot of moving parts here, but we're just trying to really give people a sense of how the Fed really impacts people uh, in their daily lives in the Playing With Fire documentary. And a lot of that comes down to simply the weird way that banks pull out loans and how it's disconnected, really, and is done in a way that causes monetary inflation and disconnected from actual deposits. And, and of course, if anyone's interested more in some of that political analysis of the purpose of the central bank, we've got a great talk that was at our supporter summit by Alex Pollock on printing power that looks at some of those historical examples. And of course, we can fast forward to the contemporary political dynamics and the rise of MMT, which is kind of explicitly a political 
school of thought trying to justify all these grand prizes and, and schemes, things like that, utilizing the Fed as the chief uh, financier there. And, uh, Dr. Jonathan Newman has done many talks on this topic and was written on this, but also has a great talk from uh, Hilton Head on that very topic as well. Now, Jonathan, we only have like two minutes. So, and we, we often get criticized. They're like, all you people, you just talk about abolishing the Fed. What about, um, you know, surely there's something else that could be done. Well, of course, we, we do articles quite often on, well, these are things short of abolishing the Fed that you could do. So if you had to have one policy change that you, you could put into place to improve the Fed and make it less horrible, what, what would be the most urgent? What would you want to see? Um, well, hard to come up with one. I, I would uh, make it illegal for the Fed to buy stuff. Excellent. So, yeah, so Lerno says that a lot too. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, you know, I might have just borrowed that uh, that from him. So yeah, if if the Fed can't buy stuff, then they can't. Uh, that that really restricts what they can do to the banking system and what they can do to to cause inflation and business cycles. Of course, another another really important step that we could take is auditing the Fed. Um, and, and so there, there, there's a reason why the in the Fed people are also the audit the Fed people. And the reason is we assume uh, it's a safe assumption, I think, that if the Fed were audited, then it would make it much more likely that we would be able to end it because many things would come to light about what the, what the Fed is doing that, that the public just isn't aware of. Um, and a great example of that was in that Alex Pollock talk that uh, Tho just mentioned about what the uh, Bank of England did to like secretly buy the government's debt. Um, and they had to do it secretly because it would just be, it would be a terrible uh, if the public realized that there wasn't enough demand for the the government's debt, and so like the the bank basically had to print up a bunch of counterfeit notes to be able to buy the the government debt. So I I wonder I don't have any evidence, but I wonder how much of that is still going on. I'm sure it is. I'm sure the Fed is doing things that are questionable. It, actually, I don't even have to wonder. There I, we might be going over time a little bit, but there was a the Fed Doomsday Book was uh, released by somebody's FOIA request, and in that book they. You actually see transcripts of, of some of their meetings where they acknowledged that they did not know if they had the legal ability to do the things that they were doing. So all, all of this new unprecedented monetary policy that we've seen since 2008, uh, brand new things that the Fed is doing, lending to uh, maiden lane corporations, buying mortgage-backed securities, uh, paying interest on reserves, all of these sorts of things are brand new. And if you look at the Doomsday Book and the transcripts, you'll see that they themselves didn't know if what they were doing was legal. And, and they said, we'll do it anyway, and we'll, we'll just let the, we'll let the lawyers figure it out later. So, so I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that if we got an audit of the Federal Reserve, that, that it, it would bring to light some pretty nasty things. See, I'm, I'm a little more cynical on that, because like, we did see all that play out. Like, and like, again, just the fact that you had the Fed creating LLCs during 08, 09, because of the kind of that legal, like, I don't know, we can really do it or not, and then still doing yeah. it. Like there was actually a, a, a kind of a, a during that time, uh, Ron Paul and uh, I think it was Alan Grayson, who was like a left wing uh, Florida congressman. They actually had a, a small kind of limited Fed audit dealing with the 08 response. And he's like, oh, yeah, here's foreign governments. just like, ah, oh, you know, we're bailing out everyone, that sort of stuff. It's just crazy what the Fed was able to, to, to get away with, like right in mm -hmm. that period of time. Uh, but yeah, it's just it's, it's nuts how, how, you know, how quickly you can you can loosen the rules there and just, uh, yeah, it's, we'll just kind of go, go along with it. And the politicians, of course, have the incentive not to question any of this when it comes. Oh, to yeah, of course. All right, well, we better wrap up with that for this episode of Radio Rothbard. Thank you to Jonathan. Thank you to Tho. And we'll be back next week with more, so we'll see you next time.